of the many languages that have ever been spoken, only a few of them have been able to achieve you know, global provenance, or they have been important enough to be considered a global language. And a lot of people have tried to look at what languages are global in the past, and they have used different measures, whether you know, a language is spoken by a large number of people, or whether the people that speak that language have a large military, or whether the people that speak that language you know, have a high level of income. And these measures, in some sense, give us an idea of which languages are more important than others, but they leave out an important dimension that help us understand the truly global importance of a language, which is the ability of a language to connect people from other languages, not only from that language. So for example, I speak Spanish and I speak English, and I can learn something you know, from my Spanish friends and then transmit it to my English friends. And basically, this multilingualism is what allows you know, information to flow you know, from one language group or from one part of the world that is subject to one culture to other parts of the world that basically are subject to different culture. The thing is, you know, although this is an observation that is, that is rather obvious, it has been so far historically impossible to measure the network of global languages and therefore use that information to help determine which are the languages that are more important. So what we have done in my group is we have you know, gone to the web and gone to different uh, repositories of data and we have been able to collect you know, information that allow us to map languages that are co-spoken with others. So we use three different data sources. The first one, we use Twitter data set, and we look at one billion tweets. And when we look at one billion tweets, we can say, well, do you express yourself in Russian in Twitter, and do you express yourself in English in Twitter? And, and we can detect the language of your tweet, and if we know that you express yourself in both languages, we know that you contribute you know, a little bit to the link between Russian speakers and English speakers. But since you don't express yourself, let's say, in Vietnamese, you do not contribute a link between Russian and Vietnamese. So that allows us to construct one version of the global language network that is particular to the subset of people that use Twitter. Then we went to Wikipedia, and Wikipedia is a very nice resource because it's available in many different languages. And we can look at people that edited Wikipedia in a, one language and in another language. So for example, a person that edited Wikipedia in German and also edited the French edition of the Wikipedia would be a person that speaks both, German and French. So that gives us another measure of this global language network. And finally, we collected you know, a, a set of 2.2 million book translations that was made available by UNESCO, and that tells us it's a book was translated, let's say, from English to Spanish, or from Spanish to Catala. And in that case, you know, the translations that we look at are you know, the, the translations that actually happen, not necessarily the ones from the language in which the book was written to the final language in which the book was expressed. So for example, a version of Tom Sawyer that was translated from Spanish to Catala would count as a link from Spanish to Catala and not from English, which is the original language in which Mark Twain wrote Tom Sawyer, to Catala. So now that we have these three networks, we have the Twitter, Wikipedia, and book translation network, you know, what we started doing is we started first you know, looking at whether these three networks were similar. After all, each one of these three networks represents very three different groups of people. Twitter people you know, are people that are very much you know, online, maybe through mobile devices. Wikipedia people, the ones that edit pages there, are people that are very much knowledge specialists, you know, that also have a big drive for contributing to public online resources. And book translators you know, are a very different group of people themselves. And what we find is that actually the three networks are quite similar. So that tells us that probably what we're capturing in the structure of this network is something that is universal to the world. What we find also in these networks is that these networks are highly hierarchical, and all of them are organized as English with the main hub. So English is the central hub in all of these networks, and then there's a few, five or 10, like peripheral hub languages, and then all of the rest of the other languages are extremely peripheral in this network. So what this means is that for a communication to go from one peripheral language, let's say Kazakh, you know, to another peripheral language, Mapugundum, we have to go from Kazakh to Russian, from Russian to English, from English to Spanish, and from Spanish to Mapudungun. We have to go up into more connected languages and then down to less connected languages. So there's a very hierarchical structure. And that hierarchical structure is, is such that if we take these networks and we start removing a few of these highly connected nodes, a few of these hub languages, we find that the network will quickly fall apart. So in most cases, actually, if we remove only five or six languages, it would be enough for the network to be almost completely disconnected. And that would mean that basically there's only five or six languages that are keeping the whole communication of the world you know, interconnected. 
So we, we were able to create these measures and we're able to see that actually the centrality or the position of a language in the network matters is is the one that you know enables the flow of information apparently and is the one that you know determines the ability of other languages to communicate but are there other ways in which we can eventually validate the centrality of a language in a language group network and actually there is so we validated the position of a language in the global language network as a measure of that language's importance by looking at two different data sets the first data set is a data set in which we took every biography of people that have presence in at least 25 language editions of the Wikipedia. So let's take someone like Elvis Presley. So does he have a presence in the English Wikipedia and in the French Wikipedia and the German Wikipedia? The answer would be yes, yes, yes. You know, and actually who have presence in tens or maybe hundreds of Wikipedias. So that gives us an idea that, well, you know, he's a very prominent character and we know that he was born in the United States. So therefore, we would attribute him to the English language group. So we look at all people that have presence in at least 25 languages in the Wikipedia. You know, and we created a data set, you know, and connected each one of them to the language uh, of the cities in which they were born. And when we look at the correlation between the number of illustrious people born to a language and the centrality of the language in the, group, uh, in the language group network, we find that actually you know, that correlation is significantly strong after we control for income and population. So basically being born into a highly connected language, it's a better predictor of whether that person is going to be important or not than you know, being born into a language that is very populous or you know, that is uh, um, you know, spoken by people that are very wealthy. We use alternatively another data set that uh, was published by Charles Murray in a book uh, a few years ago, in which he created a list of 4,000 illustrious people in the arts and sciences, and we basically find the same results, that the centrality of a language in the global language network is significantly a strong predictor of whether that language produces a large number of illustrious people after controlling for the income and the population of the language. Surprisingly, we find that, for example, Chinese, Hindi and um, Arabic are not hub languages, although they're highly popular. There's a lot of people that speak them, you know, and actually in, in some of the cases, the GDP, the total GDP associated to those languages is quite large, you know, but they're peripheral in the global language network. So basically what we have been able to find in that research project is that, you know, it is possible to quantify the importance of a language by looking at something other than the attributes of its speakers but by looking at how the language helps connect people that speak other languages. You know, how those languages intermediate the global flow of communication. And there are important implications of that type of research. You know, certainly, you know, the importance of a language can help people become informed about which languages they should learn, you know, and what are the languages that, that they should be uh, expressing their content in. Also, you know, it shows that there's, there's quite an important degree of responsibility for the speakers of those hub languages. So you can imagine now that an information that goes from one peripheral language to another and has to go through hub languages, you know, is gonna get distorted, you know, by being translated through those hub languages. People that speak that hub language have some certain degree of responsibility because through their culture, you know, is how other cultures learn from each other. So think about the way that a person that speaks Mapudungun in South Central Chile will learn about the Arab-Israeli conflict. Certainly there's probably no new sources that translate directly from you know, uh, Arab or Hebrew to Mapudungun. Uh, Mapudungun. So therefore, you know, the information is going to have to go probably you know, from Arab to English, from English to Spanish, and from Spanish to Mapudungun. That set of translations, it is very likely that even if there's no intention or bias from the translators, the story is going to get somehow distorted. There's going to be a little bit of noise. So eventually, these languages that are highly connected, these hub languages, are going to help shape the discourse and are going to help shape how distant cultures see each other. Not because they have any bias or any intention to change the way that they would see each other, but because by being the ones that are responsible for translation, they're going to certainly incorporate their ideas and their views into the process. So I think one important question that uh, you can explore from this approach is the question of language survival and where you know our global language 
is, is going to be in the future. So there's, there's a lot of like back and forth in the press about the role of English or the role of Chinese, since Chinese is a highly spoken language, and whether Chinese is going to trump English in the future. From our perspective, when we look at the connectivity in English, we realize that actually English is a language that is supported as a global language, not because of its sheer number of speakers, but because of its ability to connect the speakers of other languages. And that's a property that Chinese is lacking, despite being a language that is highly popular because of the large Chinese population. So this is start telling us that the way that language probably going to evolve or, or if there's going to be like a meta language that is going to emerge in the future, you know, probably the contributions to that meta language are going to depend on how connected those languages are right now and not necessarily on the number of speakers. So it matters how connected the language is and not how many people actually speak them. So the question is whether you know, the use of the data sources that we have employed to measure the global language network affects our results, and, and certainly they do. You know, so certainly the results that we obtain are contingent to the data that we're looking into. But in some sense, there are important remarks that we need to make in order to understand that context first. You, know, you might say, well, Twitter you know, and Wikipedia were born you know, into like, English media and they're part of the internet, and in the internet more than 50% of the languages that are being spoken in the internet are, are, are English. Basically the internet is, is, is more than half an English media. Is that a bias or is that a reflection of our times? You know? Because if you know, Arabic would be so important, maybe you know, there would be a big portion of the internet that would be in Arabic, but, but if that portion is relatively small, and if that portion tends to not connect to many other languages, you know, it probably indicates that in our times, English has become the dominant language in the dominant form of communication technology that nowadays is the web and all of the different type of web services that we use. In the case of the book translation network, we do see Russian, for example, to be a secondary hub of quite some importance, connecting to a lot of languages that were part of the former Soviet Union and of other communist countries. So for example, Russia connects you know, in book translations you know, to Kazakh or to Tajik or to Lao or to Vietnamese which are actually languages that obtain a lot of their literature during, you know, last century, you know, from Russian. Nowadays, however, you know, those type of translation efforts have, have stopped, you know, they're not as prevalent as, as they were before, you know, and now that people access information through the web, also, you know, you're seeing that uh, those languages are more connected in that sense, you know, to English than to Russian as they were in the past. So certainly, you know, there, there is, there is uh, uh, the results that are contingent, you know, to the data sets that we have used. But my question is, you know, we didn't go and choose exactly those data sets because they were, you know, the ones that would give us English, but because the ones that were available. And the fact that there are no too many other data sets available for the other languages tells us something about the prominence of those other languages. <laughs>